So there is a lot more in this book, like a lot, a lot more. I just want to note a couple of additional interesting things that she talked about. One, she talked about this concept of male and female friendship in the current state of things that the only way that men and women get together is through marriage. That once you're married, you're expected to just stay within your little family. You're not supposed to want to socialize with any members of the opposite sex, but that is very important for men and women to be able to meet each other and share their souls, so to speak, that men and women need each other for more than just the sex relation and that this is part of the problem of the sexoeconomic relation that it has made men and women oversexed, focused on the sexual relation for economic reasons and that if we can fix that with women's economic independence, then men and women will be able to have a different kind of relationship, which I think is closer to what we have today. I think it is still very difficult for men and women to be friends without having a sexual relationship, both on their part and because of the perception of other people. I think things are changing, but I think Gilman would be certainly happy to see the co-ed schools that we have, the co-ed workplaces, although I would be interested to know her opinion on hashtag me too issues in the workplace and what she thinks should be done about those, and she was all about men and women intermingling and things like that. She also talks extensively about motherhood and she says that women are trained to have an economically successful marriage, not motherhood, and that those things are opposed. Essentially that becoming pregnant, going through maternity, detracts from her ability to be excessively feminine and keep her man interested. And every child she has is another mouth for her man to feed, essentially. So she talks about the argument that people will say the main justification for this sexoeconomic relation is that it gives a advantage to motherhood because woman is specialized to maternity, but she says it's not maternity, it's the sex indulgence. And that actually this economic dependence harms motherhood, creates quote pathological maternity and decreasing birth rate. And that this is true in rich families as well as poor families, that in the rich families, the daughters and wives don't even do domestic service. They're completely unproductive their whole lives. They're just consumers. They're limited only by the size of their male relatives' wallets. And in the early times, women economically profited by having children because more children meant more labor for the tribe, but now children are just a new mouth to feed and there's no economic pressure therefore to force women toward motherhood. Even at this time in 1898, there is a strong feeling against having large families among working men. And she talks about matriolatry, like this excessive devotion to the idea of mother, that there used to be more of a devotion to the idea of father in the patriarchal era. You know, you have the stories of like the prodigal son, but then now now, you know, the dying soldier doesn't think of his father on the battlefield, he thinks of his mother. And so anything that questions the supremacy and the sanctity and the importance of motherhood, people are going to argue with you. But, you know, she says that motherhood is basically an instinct in all animals. So it's an instinct in human women as well. But part of being a human being that we have this conscious process, we can be rational. And so we should think about how best to fulfill the duty of motherhood. And she sees the duties of motherhood as one, to reproduce the race by reproducing the individual, and number two, to improve the race by improving the individual. So she has this concept of right motherhood, which is to leave in the world a creature better than its parent. And she essentially lays out her argument that mothers aren't doing that great of a job. The fact that all these children are dying in childbirth goes to show that naturally it's not like women are exactly killing it in the having babies game. And again, coming back to these principles of scientific management. She's very into the science and progress and industry. She thinks that more attention and thought needs to be given to the best way to mother, what is the most efficient and the scientific principles and what's best for the baby, and not just relying on women to naturally figure it all out. She's very into education, taking children outside of the home to be among other children, even as a baby, to help them see that it's not just about them and their small little family, it's about the wider society. Also that this will give the mother more hours to herself to be a member of society, to produce economically, and to grow as an individual, which will make her stronger and wiser as a mother and produce better offspring in turn, and that she will love her child better when she's not in hourly contact with it. And that not every woman is born 
with the talent or personality to take proper care of children. Not every woman can be instructed or trained to take care of children properly and no one has the experience for it. When you have your first child, you've never had a child before and there's no life experience to prepare you for it the way that you could prepare for a different sort of career. And that the knowledge is not properly transmitted, that essentially no mother knows more than her mother knew. It's a, an amateur practice. It's not professional. And she says an economically independent mother will do better as a mother. So that this is one of the most important things that society can do to improve motherhood and child rearing. When the mother is doing her full duty, that she will make better men, improve the race, she will hold herself socially responsible, and she will do half duty in providing for the children as an economically free agent. Whereas right now she's not pulling her weight economically. And that women have been denied activities which develop their intelligence the way men have been able to develop their intelligence. Gilman says that we praise women for having children when really it's just an instinct and doesn't mean that she's good at it and that we really need to get scientific about it. A young girl doesn't know or study what would make someone a good prospective father and choose accordingly. I think that some of her views on motherhood are largely informed by her postpartum trauma and I think there are plenty of women who are like her who want more separation from their children. They don't want to be around their children all the time. doesn't mean that they don't love them, but that's their personality. That's their perspective in relationship to motherhood. But for a lot of women, they like being around the children all the time. They like being home. She also talks a lot about how the overemphasis on family and marriage is unfair for people who are not able to find that. All the ideas of home, etc., are focused on that. So for people who are single, it's more difficult. So she wanted to move toward more housing for individuals. So she'd probably be happy to see, you know, in cities, all the apartments that you can get a studio apartment and that's perfectly normal. Also of note, she has this whole thing about how it's totally inefficient that everyone cooks in their own house that she envisions in the future. So apartment buildings in cities where there would be a centralized kitchen and dining space and people would just come there to eat, you know, they could order their meals, whatever. But you know, she was very much about the science and what's most efficient and best. So you would have the professional chefs, not these amateur women screwing everything up with no knowledge of nutrition and best cooking principles. Or if you were in suburbia, that there would be all these houses that all connected through some sort of like breezeway to a central cooking, eating area. And that also you'd make the house cleaner because back then, you know, you would have like the fireplace that was involved with the cooking and that would be removed. So you would have less to clean in the house, but that essentially women would learn how to become cooks or cleaners on a more higher level, like on a professional level, because not every woman is really good at cooking and cleaning and taking care of children, etc. You kind of specialize in, in whatever. And largely what she's talking about in this book is not what most feminists today are always saying, here's what men need to do. Here's what men need to do differently. Here's what men are doing wrong. It's all men's fault. She said, that this is the way things have been. She's acknowledging it, but she's saying, look, progress is happening. Women are becoming more economically independent and women, now that you are being given all these opportunities, you need to be cognizant of the ways you have been conditioned and to move past those. That is her intended audience for this book. I'm sure she hoped men would read it also, but she is trying to reach her peers. That's it for this video. I'm not sure what the next video in this series will be, I might try to read some of the literature from the suffragettes, but we'll see. I'm also going back to take some notes on the moral case for fossil fuels, and I'm hoping to get that one out soon. Thank you all for watching. If you like this video, give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I'll have more content for you very soon.